All right, this is Jay's Analysis.com. This is Jay Dyer back with you. This time I have with me Jennifer Sodini of EvolveAndAscend.com. If you recall, Jennifer interviewed me maybe a couple months ago and we discussed MK Ultra and the in depth aspects of that program in terms of mind control, alternate personalities, and so forth. This time I'm going to be talking more about Jennifer's own life, and we're going to talk to her about what she thinks about all these different weird movies from the 80s. So we had all these, this sort of rash of 80s esoterica, but before we get to that, I want to talk to Jennifer about her own life. She's had some really, really interesting experiences that uh, Jay's analysis listeners and readers should hear, and we want to get her at her perspective on Egyptology, on... Uh, what she calls sun language, on uh, the experiences she's had with maybe um, other worldly entities, things like that, and then maybe just go from that to a particular 80s specimen that sticks out called Legend that was, um, I'm sure most people have seen it, Ridley Scott's film from the 80s, so we're going to talk about the symbolism in that movie, but Jennifer, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing today, Jay? Excellent. So tell us about you. How did you tell us a little bit of your background, whatever you're comfortable sharing, and then how did you get into this crazy esoteric stuff? <laughs> well, um, as long as I can remember, it's been a part of my life. Uh, I grew up with a crazy grandma that read Aleister Crowley and taught me about tarot when I was eight years old. So from the time I can even I, I fathom this has been just an ongoing discussion in my life. You know, my grandmother, I credit her as one of my greatest teachers, but, um, you know, she was really interested in the darker side of, of spirituality and knowledge of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and because of her, I mean, I grew up in a family that didn't really follow religion and, uh, my grandmother had a strong opposition against the Catholic Church. I mean, in her will, she stated that if any of us went to a Catholic school that we wouldn't have our college paid for. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. And, you know, she was nuts. I mean, um, my cousin's my cousin's father wasn't really that great of a guy, and I remember my grandmother making a voodoo doll out of a potato, and, you know, she was just uh, was a character. But because of her, it kind of allowed me to be exposed to that information at a really young age. So as a kid, you weren't making potato batteries. You were making <laughs> potato batteries that were voodoo dolls. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> but I mean, it's just, it's stranger than fiction. But um, after she passed away, you know, it, it, it um, kind of just sent me further down the exploration path. And when I was like 12, I was reading Communion by Whitley Strieber, and I was like really interested in the alien tip. And then mm -hmm. it evolved as I, you know, became an adult. I just, um, I studied with a rabbi for two years, and I almost converted to Judaism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've kind of <laughs> dabbled in it all. But um, well, I think it's good to get an first-hand sort of existential experience of a, a bunch of different traditions because I kind of come from the perspective that if you don't if you don't experience it firsthand you, it's very difficult to have a real picture of what it's all about I mean you can read about stuff in books all day but if you're not you know if you're not going through it existentially firsthand then it's it's you know you never know if what you're getting in the book is accurate or you know it could just be all theoretical you know what I'm saying yeah. Well, that's like the alchemy of life, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of like start with your base and then through, through ex experience, those are like the chemicals that kind of transform you and you can either kind of like take it to a darker place or transmute it into light. And, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, you can read a million things in a book, but until you experience it firsthand, it's just words, you know? Right. So, so let's go back to when you're a kid, you're in the eighties. What well, do you, we listed some films that stood out to us. What, uh, I always felt like some of these, you know, like the dark crystal or labyrinth or some of these, like, even as a kid, I felt like there was more going on here. There was that this was, you know, telling us something deeper about not just, uh, you know, life. Uh, I mean, granted, these are kind of the new mythologies, you know, ancient people had stories of the gods and the myths. And I guess Hollywood's kind of taken that new role, but, I, st I still think that there's something actually being told through these films. I mean, in other words, it's not just 
you know, telling a mythological story to make money. I think they're actually still presenting, you know, deeper truths that most people wouldn't be interested in looking at. What do you think about that? I agree completely. And, um, you know, before, before I really could make sense of it all when I was younger, it did speak to me on a really deep level. And I think Jim Henson was really a master at that. And that's why I was so drawn to movies like The Dark Crystal and The right. Labyrinth. But I mean, that's why even what we covered in, in our analysis, which I'm sure we're going to delve into soon, just The Wizard of Oz, Return to Oz, there's a way through film where you can express something that I think is a universal truth. Mm-hmm. With, in a like less abrasive way, you know, like it's, it's, that's the beauty of art where you can take something and it can evoke a feeling or, or just that universal truth on a different level. So, but I mean, the 80s in particular, I mean, it yeah. was like some, some wild stuff going on. There was, <laughs> especially for kids. And, and yeah. one thing that I think is really, I don't know, bizarre is not the right word, but uh, curious is that. A lot of these films I've noticed tend to have this, they tend to be directed at kids that are adolescent and so that are, that are transitioning into puberty. And so you're going to see the sexual theme in a lot of these films kind of very subtly, you know, putting them, put that imagery is, is pushing through because it, it's targeted at an audience that is, you know, a lot of them are coming into puberty. So I think that the, uh, the imagery that sticks in our subconscious, like David Bowie and and those tights. (laughs) That's not, that's in my subconscious maybe is traumatic, but for a lot of girls, I've had actually a lot of girls tell me that, Oh, I used to watch labyrinth that I I thought uh, David Bowie was so hot. (laughs) Yeah. Same here. It was weird because I was young, but I remember like having like fantasies about the goblin king. There you go. Right. So, (laughs) and I think it has to do with the fact, and of course I had a crush on Jennifer Connelly from that movie. Yeah. (laughs) I think that um, it's more than just putting, you know, using using sexual imagery or using innuendos or whatever. Because it, there's a my thesis on, for example, labyrinth, and we don't have to go into this yet. But uh, I think that it's at this period where, at least from a spiritual perspective, you know, puberty is where you there's a lot of uh, physical changes happening in the body. You know, a lot of chemical changes, and from an alchemical perspective, this is an important phase in your life as you're progressing and. and becoming an adult and that's you know the period of sexual awakening so i think that there's a definite intentional usage of the the psychological journey that happens to a person who's transitioning into puberty and i think these directors are intentionally doing that with these films and that's why you see these subtle undertones you know as we said with uh with legend that's why the, the imagery of the, the unicorn is, is ultimately really going to be sexual imagery. Exactly. I mean, when you look at the horn, it's very phallic and, you know, it, there's this whimsical like magic to it. But I mean, what it's like the same same concept as, you know, before for the audience, before I connected with Jay and we developed our friendship, I never really believed in angels you know I I didn't really know what I thought about it I read about it but I wasn't sure and then you see these images where you know it's these like muscular beings with wings and you know like is that really what like an otherworldly being looks like (laughs) but through art you kind of can like convey an idea which is like almost impossible to explain but, um, you yeah. know, with the unicorn as, like, representing, like, the orgasm or sexual energy, I mean, you can't just, like, go out and put an idea, like, just out there and be like, okay, sex. Exactly, right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like taking that and using it as an allegory. Exactly. And like you said, uh, from, from the perspective of hermeticism or esoterica or even just ancient religion in general, the regenerative process is... is uh, you know, sort of the foundation of at least most ancient pagan religions. So, for example, ancient Mesopotamia, you know, ancient Rome, whatever, they all had this notion of the centrality of the the natural process in terms of, you know, the seed falls into the earth, up springs the tree. You know, this sort of mimics the idea of, you know, the man impregnating the woman, the seed. So this is really the basis of so many ancient religions and the whole, the whole idea of the mother goddess and all that. But for those who, say, might be skeptical, um, I'm going to read a a quote from Carl Jung where he talks about unicorn symbolism 
in the tradition of alchemy. He says the unicorn in alchemy is an example of it's, it's an example chosen to demonstrate how the symbolism of Mercury is intermingled in the traditions of pagan Gnosticism as well as the Christian Church. As the unicorn is not a single, clearly identified entity, more specific concern is centered on the beast with a single horn, or the alicorn. Examples are given in the literature, especially from the chemical wedding of Christian Rosencrantz, who would that would be the founder of uh, Rosicrucianism, in which the unicorn, the lion, and the dove appear as symbols of Mercury. Reference is also made to medieval art in which images of the Virgin and the unicorn appear. These images are said to represent the dual aspect of Mercury, the Virgin as the passive, feminine aspect of the unicorn, and the unicorn or lion as the wild, ramp rampant, masculine force. References from the Church Fathers are variously given in which the unicorn is identified with, say, the God of the Old Testament or of Christ. It is pointed out that these are ecclesiastical quote, quotations in which the unicorn is said to carry out an element of evil. It is this inner contradiction that makes the unicorn an appropriate symbol to be used by the alchemists in terms of their monstrum hermaphro hermaphroditum, or the hermaphrodite, a key stage of the unification process in alchemy. And I think that encapsulates why it's central to uh, not just um, legend, uh, but also Blade Runner. Uh, there's a curious scene in Blade Runner where Deckard sees uh, this unicorn in a dream. And most people had a lot of you know, hard time figuring out, well, why would uh, you know, Harrison Ford's character, the robot, in this uh, Blade Runner story, why would he have this mysterious dream of a unicorn? Uh, and it's the reason that I'm pointing that out is because Ridley Scott did Legend as well as Blade Runner. And so both films center on this curious aspect of the unicorn. And in other words, both of them have the same uh, mythological journey where you have not just the, the sexual aspect, but it's also the unitive aspect of two opposites of the male and the female. Completely. And you know what's fascinating actually just kind of popped into my mind now when you think about it. I mean... The unicorn, just from a visual standpoint, it, it would be the perfect representation because, you know, the horse is so, such this beautiful mythical creature, mm -hmm. but with the horn, I mean, that, <laughs> it's almost like the synthesis of something that you can either create or destroy. And that's what sexual energy really is. I mean, it's, it can either be used to procreate or it actually can be used to destroy. And, um... The horn, like looking at that, like it's this beautiful thing, but it has the potential to kill. Yeah, exactly. Sex and death are often tied together, you know, in a perennial sense, uh, because yeah. it, it tends to have the ability either to create life or, you know, to ruin people. You know, yeah. <laughs> men fall in love with women and end up killing themselves. Women go crazy and, you know, kill their husbands. You know, anything like that's possible from a psychological standpoint. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you're battling that temptation, you know, because everybody's human. You right. can't discount that no matter how much you're in love with somebody, there's always going to be temptation. Exactly. And the potential of, uh, you know, another person, you know, finding, finding somebody else, <laughs> finding, yeah. their, finding their alchemical union elsewhere. But so is there anything else that, that sticks out in your past before we really get into these movies? I I apologize. I don't. I went right into the films, but no, it's okay. <laughs> tell us, is, so tell us about a little bit more about uh, you know how you came to deciding. Well, I'm going to start a website that talks about all this esoteric stuff. Oh, perfect. Okay, so um, you know, like I said, as a kid, I, I was exposed to this information at a very young age. But then, you know, in my early twenties, I uh, my my dad passed away a week after I turned twenty one, and that kind of just led me to kind of go to the dark side. So I spent, you know, my early 20s partying in Manhattan, trying to, like, mask the pain of my father's death by pretending to be Paris Hilton in New York, you know? I completely, like, lost myself and forgot, didn't forget, I guess, just put everything else on the back burner. And I called it kind of like going into the closet. So um, in 2012, I... Uh, now, you've, you know, now you've come out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Coming out of the closet. Um, in 2012, I, you know, on top of everything else, I'm, I'm highly intuitive and I'm, I'm very sensitive to energies and just, you know, I'm like the weird chick that dreams things, they come true. Like, you know, aside from learning the cards, I, I 
I'm pretty good at communicating the messages that I'm able to receive. But um, in 2012, I felt this crazy shift of energy, like where I was just like, oh, my God, something is happening and I don't know what. Um, it was just like one sign after another of like remembering, remember who you are. You need to write. You need to like really be who you are. So, you know, I, I went down uh, my own little rabbit hole of just kind of like remembering a lot of what I learned. And then um, I got really wrapped up in conspiracy and just kind of like, holy shit, like what's happening in the world. Mm-hmm. And um, looking for information, I kept finding a lot of great stuff. But then I, I would get roadblocks where there would be this amazing esoteric spiritual conspiracy all in that realm. Mm-hmm. But the website sucked. Like they were all like just like a stale aesthetic. And, you know, there would always they'd always take a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> Let, but, what, uh, in terms of, quote, conspiracy, what, is there a certain, you know, did you watch something that, that had an impact on you? Did you read some essay or article? Was it, you know, some I just documentary? What, what, what? YouTube rabbit hole. You gotcha. know, okay. I was watching stuff on the Federal Reserve. Right, I was right. watching, um, you know, I get, I'm drawing a blank on how, what, what particular one it was because there were so many. Yeah, there's a million. But a lot of it was just like crappy stuff on YouTube. Where I was like, oh my God, the government's run by Satanists. This is yeah. crazy. <laughs> but, um, you know, one, one documentary that I did find, though, that inspired me that, you know, it did talk about the problems, but it, it put them more in like a solution based way was um, 2012 Time for Change. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that was done by Daniel Pinchbeck and uh, he, he had this has the site evolver and reality sandwich. And I really liked the way that they were going about things. Mm-hmm. So I decided to, to create my own amalgamation of it all. So that's why I started involved in ascend. And in the beginning I was going into every topic, you know, like conspiracy, spirituality, esoteric, mm-hmm. all, all of it. But then, um, you know, I'd say in the past year or so, I've really kind of like chipped away a lot of, of what I, wasn't my strong suit and I've really just placed more focus on like the esoteric spirituality and interviews and things such as that. But, um, yeah, 2012 was my coming out of the closet and just really fully being out in the world of this is what I know. This is what I have found to be true. And, uh, Hey, you know, we, <laughs> we have the potential to make this experience really great, but we're not really using our full potential. So maybe ask more questions and be a little more creative. Mm-hmm. In a nutshell, I guess that that's what <laughs> led yeah. me further to, to do what I'm doing with Evolve and Ascend. Well, it does seem to be the case that the conspiracy route tends to kind of point people into grand narrative explanations or looking at the possibility of, of, not just the questions of the Federal Reserve or 9-11, but then you start asking deeper questions, more philosophical questions, I guess. Like, well, why is this happening here in this country? What, has this always been this way? What, you know, what, is there good and evil? Are there forces behind this? Is this? Yeah. In other words, it, it forces you to ask, I think, big-scale questions that a lot of times people don't ask. Completely. And when, when we know what we've come to know and study what we've come to study... It, you can't help but wonder what they know, you know, Cause it's like if we have access to this information and we're able to discover it on our own, you know, the powers that be have a whole hell of a lot more <laughs> and it's only the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I, it's just even what we've come to, to look into. I mean, I can't even imagine how much more is be behind the veil. Right. I mean, the, the Internet was given by the very establishment that, you know, I mean, they're the ones that run the secret technology and all that. So, I mean, they had the Internet back in the 60s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they they made it public intentionally, right? So I'm not saying that that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. All I'm saying is that from their perspective, uh, they probably had some idea that this would, you know, be let loose and that it would actually cause a significant portion of the population, I think, to question things and, and to educate themselves. But uh, it is important to remember that the the internet is a self spy technology. I mean, it was, well, it was yeah, created yeah, in the, so. <laughs> yeah, in, in the, the circles of, you know, DARPA and the Pentagon for, um, you know, wartime, uh, espionage information, uh, you know, to send coded information, encrypted information. So this is a, a tool that's from the spy world that's, you know, been let loose on the public. And I think probably what they wanted to do, at least in, at one level, you know, was to see what, what would happen. Now, I think that, 
there are long-term usages for the internet that relate to uh, artificial intelligence and creating creating kind of a synthetic subconscious that would use all the information that's been uploaded and, and uh, tracked on the internet to function as a subconscious for the for the coming AI. I don't think that AI is going to be sentient. But anyway, that's a whole different topic. So it is interesting to see, you know, maybe, um, maybe U-turns and different decisions have to be made when, you know, things don't always necessarily go to plan, go according to plan. So maybe they put the internet out there to see what would happen. And, and maybe more people have used it in a positive way than, you know, it was originally conceived. I don't know, but, um, uh, you know, it's it definitely does seem to be having effect an effect on um, on waking people up. You know, a lot a lot more than I would have expected. I guess say ten, fifteen years ago. Well, completely. I mean, it's it's um, you have so much more access to everything. You know, it's like the living living library of of, of life. Yeah, the living Alexandria. Now you yeah. have also have a esoteric. Um, what do you what do you call it? A uh, esoteric encyclopedia. Exactly <laughs> right. In fact. Uh, I get people that mess with me all the time and they're like, I don't know what these words are using all these terms. And I don't know what this, not just philosophical terms, but also a lot of terms from mythology and esoteric traditions and so forth. So uh, what is that exact address? Cause I think people might be able to, you know, find that helpful if they hear the stuff I'm talking about, you know, sounds uh, far fetched or they're unfamiliar with it. Definitely. Um, yeah, if you go on our site, um, we, we had a link to it, but I took it down because it's still a work in progress. But every Tuesday, we do a new entry. So I'm basically starting at A and working my way through, through as much of it as I can. So every Tuesday, we do a new esoteric encyclopedia entry, and eventually I'll have a link on the site with everything on there as a resource for people to browse through. All right, let's get into some of the movies. So we did an article together that uh, covered... 10 classic fantasy films, mainly basically 80s movies that everybody grew up with that's in our general age group. And we started with uh, Never Ending Story, and even though I did that, what are your thoughts on Never Ending Story? Well, the Never Ending Story for me, I mean, as a child, I, I loved it to death, but, at, you know, after kind of having my reawakening, watching that movie and just really understanding the deeper meaning. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It and is, I, right. I, I've spent some time with Rudolf Steiner's work and just about the higher self, lower self concepts. And I mean, it's just a beautifully, beautiful visual representation of, of the power of imagination and just the dreamscape, I guess, of all that. It is. And from a philosophical perspective, I was surprised how much, um, well, it, mythology and and philosophy play into that film quite a bit because uh, if you if you recall, Bastion, the protagonist, uh, like you said, has a higher self. And so when I was reading about Michael Enda, the author, uh, I was I wasn't I, I guess it, when I reviewed the film in my twenties was when I was really starting to wake up to stuff. Uh, you know, I started thinking, man, there's more to this movie. There's a lot going on here that I've never really paid attention to. So watching it three or four times and then, you know, doing an analysis on it, it really struck me that this is really, really packed with esoterics. Like, it's not just, you know, we, there's a lot of movies that might have a, you know, Masonic symbol here or there or something like that. But this is, is really pretty elaborate in its, uh, you know, in its presentations. So, uh, for example, when he, you know, when he's uh, at the end, when he's, after he's been through Fantasia, you know, he actually screams out the name of of who he of, of his higher self, if you were, or whatever he's supposed to. It's his mom, I think. He's supposed to call out the name, of his, and he says it's Moonchild. <laughs> <laughs> so when Fantasia is imploding, so basically you have this. It's almost it's very Crowleyan, and Michael Ende was um, influenced quite a bit by Crowley. So you have this idea that there's this higher self of this you that exists in sort of this ether or astral realm or this dream realm or whatever, and so the events that you're participating in in this world in this plane you know that's sort of translating also to events that are happening on that other level of reality and so the process of of what bastion is going through in this presentation is this union with his higher self and that's why when he goes through these different gates you know his higher self uh uh in the uh 
in the higher realm, uh, what's the what's the kid's name? I forget his his uh, his uh, yeah. When Atreyu get, reaches the final gate, uh, and he looks in the mirror and he sees Bastion. <laughs> so that's that whole that was the whole point of that. And right, so the that whole world comes to an end, and that coming to an end of that world was kind of the the signifier to Bastion that sort of he's sort of the ruler of his own world. In other words, he's one, the one that's actually making or writing the story, the never ending story. I wanted to tell you, Jennifer, also that it reminded me of the tradition of the Sphinx or of in biblical theology, the Seraphim, because in the Ark of the Covenant, you have two Seraphim that are kind of facing each other uh, in much the same way that you see the trial that Atreyu has to go through, you know, where he has to run past the Sphinxes who look at him and, you know, they fire blue laser blue 80s lasers at him uh and then he comes to the gate so in other words passing through that uh doorway that gateway is something that's not unique to the never ending story it has, it has a long history and it goes back to ancient egypt with the concept of that there's sort of living creatures to use the biblical theology that are in a way situated between the passages from one dimension to the next and what's fascinating, too, is the concept of him being able to pass through, of, of being aware of his worth, you know, back in a, the Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? I mean, when, when they were talking oh, yeah, about yeah. the Ark, people melted and died. I mean, I wonder if it was because of the ego surrounding it and exactly. having access to higher worlds, you have to be ego-less. Right, right. No, it's a great point. I didn't even think about um, Raiders of the Lost Ark because that's that scene... You know, you're right, it encapsulates the very same idea. So, I don't know if you've ever heard about uh, Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Jung. They have a correspondence where, you know, Carl Jung representing the, you know, psychoanalytical approach to dreams and the subconscious, and then Wolfgang Pauli representing the, you know, pi one of the pioneers of quantum physics and, you know, the rational approach to things. Pauli, uh, was having these bizarre dreams where he was seeing uh, a huge living clock that was like a bird. And so he was talking to Carl Jung about these dreams he was having, and he genuinely believed that a lot of the physics discoveries that he was engaged in were coming to him from this living creature that he saw. Uh, so I have an article that details the similarities between this huge spherical living creature that's a bird and Ezekiel's visions of the cherubim. In other words, it's the same, it's the same principle. And I don't, I don't, most people I don't think are aware of the fact that one of the top quantum physicists of the 20th century was basically claimed to have seen a cherubim. Wow. That's fascinating. And I mean, like what you were saying where there's seraphim and cherubim, how many different le levels in the hierarchy are there? Nine, nine choirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the in a lot of esoteric traditions, nine is the number of initiation. So there's a direct connection between the numerology of that of that number and you know the process of the individual through you know through the initiatory process going on to uh, you know understand deeper mysteries about the world, basically. So I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a reason for the connection between the number nine and the fact that classically there's a, a hierarchy of, uh, you know, nine celestial realms. Completely. So next, let's go to E.T. Uh, on our list here. We did a discussion of E.T. And uh, yet another Moonchild reference, perhaps, with the fact that, you know, Elliot has this continual association in the film with the moon. Yeah, there's a, a few scenes that you pointed out in your analysis where not just the classic scene that everybody is aware of with him mm -hmm. riding the bike over it, but even just subtle references in Elliot's home and right. just, you know, things that you wouldn't be quite aware of that are in the subconscious of the film. What do you think about Spielberg and all the, all his uh, alien stuff? I think he's, do you think he was trying to tell us something deeper? Have you seen Close Encounters, by the way? Yes, I've seen Close Encounters, yeah. and that's one of my favorite films. 
Um, what's fascinating to me about Spielberg is that compared to many of the other directors out there, he's one of the few that presented extraterrestrial life as a friendly, as opposed to, you know, the, the alien versus right. predator, like <laughs> right. horrifying imagery, you know, between Close Encounters, E.T., even, um, what was that movie the, with the kids and the film? Super, Super 8. Super 8, you know, although the, the alien was misunderstood, I think it was not meant to be, like, malevolent. It just became that way because of how it was treated. So I think that Spielberg was, was pretty dialed in, and um, I, th I think he, he probably has a deeper awareness than a lot of people. But. Absolutely. I mean, I think he's, he uses Kabbalistic imagery quite a bit in his films, too, so I, I think that would suggest that he's a lot more aware than most people would think. Definitely. But it is it is fascinating to me that really he's one of the few out there that presented them in the benevolent nature. Right. So we did Dark Crystal. Um, that one, I think, is the first one that you said you read of mine that you came across that brought you to my material. Exactly. That's actually how I, I came to find you. Um, when I revisited uh, the Dark Crystal, especially after kind of going through a whole another spiritual awakening, mm -hmm. looking at it through a different lens, I'm like, holy, oh my God, there's definitely a lot more going on here than meets the eye. There is. Tell so, me, tell me some of your thoughts about. I know I did the analysis on this, but tell me your impression of this film because well, it, it's pretty, I mean, we, it's pretty deep. Even related back to the concept of higher self, lower self, with never-ending story about how there's everything's attached to one another. You know, Never Ending Story takes it on more like multi-dimensional plane, mm -hmm. but looking at it here from this perspective, you know, the Skeksis and the Mystics, while seemingly different from one another, they're equal parts of a whole. They're just fragmented aspects of the psyche, right. just in extremes. So <clears throat> seeing that and understanding, you know, that juxtaposition between the two may be so extreme, but they're really parts of an equal whole. So whatever affects one affects the other. Whatever affects this world affects other worlds. Mm -hmm. So it seems to have a similar occurring theme of connectedness and understanding that. What about, though, the question of the fact that the Skeksis kidnap the Gelflings and sap their magical energy through a, some sort of mind control uh, process. Well, to me, that seems to, to represent what's going on now. Right, you know? right, yeah. You have, you have the sages and the mystics and, you know, the monks that, that are, you know, kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Custodians of right. spiritual information. And then the antithesis of that is the people in the corporate world and the people that control our money system and exactly. how they control us. So the Skeksis are, I mean, when you look at how horrifying and disgusting and putrid they are and what they're doing to these Gelflings, which are basically us, I mean, it's it's just kind of a mystic way of what's what's going on now with those who are in control. It really is. And, and it's they're very parasitical and the Skeksis have a, an imperial order. So they're waiting for the next, you know, emperor to take, take the throne to, to ascend. Exactly. Uh, and so they're, and, and, and it's, they're vultures. So that that's, you know, intentionally portraying, uh, you know, a bird of prey that feeds on a carcass. So. Exactly. And I mean, I don't think it's any, any coincidence that they do kind of resemble uh, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. <laughs> 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 kind of like how Mr. Burns kind of has the exact same, totally. you know, from the uh, what a, Mr. Burns. And if you ever listen to <laughs> David Rockefeller, that's exactly how he talks in lectures. I'd like to thank the United Nations for having me here. <laughs> One step away from mm. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but now, you know, Henson was definitely very, very advanced right. in his, his knowledge. Now, I rewrote my Labyrinth analysis just because it was, I think, the first film review that I did probably seven years ago. And originally, it, it, it stuck out, and I thought, you know, if I should write a, do a site that kind of just focuses on film reviews. And I, the reason I chose Labyrinth is because it's so wacky, even goofier and sillier than D The Dark Crystal, and yet still has all these strange elements. And I know we already touched on, on Labyrinth, but... Um, I came to the conclusion that I think that ultimately it 
in the same way as these other worlds that we see in uh, Dark Crystal or something like that or, or Never Ending Story. Labyrinth seems to have that same principle yet again, but it's, it's Sarah's own subconscious that she's, that she's dealing with because you, if you notice all the elements that are in her room, like there's a little statue of Jareth, there's uh, an actual toy labyrinth, you know, there's MC Escher's drawing is on the wall. All the elements in her bedroom make up the, you know, the, the artifacts of her experience in the labyrinth. Exactly. And in the, at the labyrinth is a great representation of the mind, you know, the many exactly. the mind right. and the twists and the turns and not taking anything for granted. Yeah. Because where there may not be a door, there actually may be a door. Right. So. I want to read this quote real quick if you don't mind but uh from carl Jung's one of his publications his one of his students uh wrote the maze of strange passages chambers and unlocked exits in the cellar recalls the old egyptian representation of the underworld which is a well-known symbol of the unconscious with its abilities it also shows how one is open to another to other influences in one's unconscious shadow side and how uncanny uncanny alien elements can break in so I, I connect this, by the way, to the fact that she's going through puberty because uh, she's right at that age where she's interacting with her evil stepmother. And her stepmother says, why don't you go out on a date? You know, you're sitting around reading your, your fairy tale books. Go find a boy. Go do something. And she's hesitant to do that. And so there's all these kind of weird, almost sexual bodily function images throughout the labyrinth. And so it's kind of her unconscious trying to make sense of what it is to grow into this adult world. Definitely. And not to, not to interrupt you from before, but in the beginning, wasn't she reading an Aleister Crowley book, Another Weird Synchronicity? No, she's actually reading uh, the labyrinth in the, in the, the film. Okay, so I thought there was some Crowley reference in it, or something. Mm, mistaken. I don't, not that I can recall, but I mean, probably in a loose sense. But uh, no, there's actually so there's kind of a meta narrative going on there where she's reading the labyrinth. That's the story that she reads. So when she confronts Bowie at the end, she says, "Jara," she says, "You know, you have no power over me." So in other words, she comes to the realization that all of the fears and the the uh, you know, whatever problems she's having psychologically with, you know, transitioning into adulthood and the loss of her mom and all that. Uh, they're all creations of her psyche. So that, in other words, the problems are all things that she's constructed that she has to deal with. And so she comes to the realization that this is, this is a manifestation of my psyche. Exactly. And ironically, it's the one line that she could never remember. in the beginning. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Right. Good point. <laughs> That now, I, this is just another question that popped into mind, you know, talking about just another underlying theme in the story. A lot of it is asking the right questions and knowing knowing what the right words to say. Good point, right? And, you know, we talked about angels and cherubim and seraphim, but do you think, you know, the goblins are representatives of, like, the demons and summoning demons to do her bidding? Yeah, that's weird because she almost unintentionally... Uh, invokes them and she mm -hmm. you know it's a, it's a clear invocation at the beginning when she's saying i wish the goblin king would just come and take you away goblin king goblin king come take you know this yeah. baby away so she is invoking you know this other world and you know that that age is often the, the period when i think a lot of girls you know want to experiment with witchcraft or something like that so i think in a loose sense yeah i think she's um She's she's working with the dark side as well as, uh, but but it's weird because she she invokes the dark side and then realizes that when she's in the <laughs> labyrinth, it's not everything that she thought it would be. She thought it would, you know, be an easy, uh, an easy shortcut, an easy path. You know, it makes me think of uh, what does Yoda say to to Luke in Star Wars? You know, the dark side is easier, quicker, but more dangerous, something like that. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think that is what's going on there. All right. Now, the next one that you did, uh, you, I saw this when I was a kid, and uh, but I didn't remember much about it. So I was really excited to see your pretty in-depth analysis of this, which I, thought, which I thought was really spot on from what I recall of the film. So tell us about Last Unicorn. 
Well, the last unicorn for me, I hadn't seen it in a while, but the reason why I connected to it so much is that last unicorn tapestry was something I grew up with a lot. Another, another uh, thing my crazy grandma <laughs> exposed me to at a young age. But, you know, as a child, I was drawn to it because I loved unicorns. But then as an adult, you know, I, I found the deeper meaning you know, we talked about that a unicorn could represent sexuality, right. you know, being this beautiful thing through creation or destruction. But on another level, it, I think it also represents the notion of like that Christ consciousness or that purity of, of self. So, you know, when, when I took another look back at the movie and kind of applied it to the tapestry of the hunt of the unicorn, it just seems to be that kind of journey of, of, you know, being that pure spirit, that pure consciousness, and then making the right choices along this way to, to you know, follow your heart instead of getting caught up in your head kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but, now, um, is the unicorn, does it, is it, are they trying to sacrifice it? I don't recall. Um, yeah, the whole film kind of follows that she's the last of her kind. Mm -hmm. And she's coming to find the uh, find or try and save any of the remaining unicorns. So along the way, she encounters a witch and, you know, all of this kind of magic. And she comes to find out that the last of her kind are being, um, I guess, they had been taken by the Red Bull, mm -hmm. ironically, which seems to represent, like, the devil. Sure. Um, but um, along it, you know, she winds up getting transformed into... A person. So she goes from being the unicorn and then transforms into a person and then winds up falling in love. But she, at the end, she winds up having to sacrifice love and you know her her immortalness for her people. So it's kind of like the whole concept of martyrdom through experience mm, and yeah. preserving that. Right. And what did you take away from it? I mean, I know that you my analysis well, resonated. But. It immediately it immediately made me think again of legend because it's there's a very similar pattern here in Western medieval traditions. The unicorn and the hunt is obviously representative of sexuality. So the idea of going out on the hunt and trying to you know capture the prey has a direct correlation to sexuality, but. Yeah, I, th I think that the Christ imagery there is pretty fascinating. I, w I probably wouldn't have noticed that because I'm so used to, you know, thinking in terms of, uh, you know, non-Christian imagery in uh, in films that I probably would have missed that. But but again, it's just like we were saying about uh, Blade Runner. The, the, the unicorn imagery there can be read in different ways, too. So, so yeah, the unicorn is a really it's a it's a. It's more of an elastic symbol, I guess. It's kind of hard to pin down at times. And I wonder if just throwing this out there, kind of getting out in left field, I, w I almost wonder if the unicorn might not have some kind of sort of possible pre-signification of something transhumanist because the idea of genetic modification, you know, leads... W w the idea of gen genetic modification goes back to ancient mythology, right? So you have the pictures of the gods, you know, they tend to be, you know, like Thoth, like a, a hawk head on top of a, of, of a man's body. And so when we see this imagery of uh, blended species, you know, that's the very thing that's going on today. And I find it very you know, hard to accept that, that there's no connection between those two ideas, you know, how, if, if Plato knows about, you know, subatomic particles having a certain structure, the platonic solids, how he knows that, nobody knows. But I don't think it's much of a leap to consider the possibility that even in ancient, you know, sort of primeval, primeval consciousness or, or through contact with the divine or something like that, the idea or the, the possibility of genetic modification is something that man would discover over time. Do you see what I'm getting at? I do, and I think it makes sense because even if you look back to the Emerald Tablet, you could take that in the same way. Exactly. Where there's the one line where it says, man is in the process of changing to forms that are not of this earth. Yes, grows exactly. grows to the formless plane right. on the cycle above. So it's all about ascending, transcending, and you can kind of take that and transform it as you will. I think it's dangerous, though. You know, We don't really know what we're doing when we blend 
you know, monkeys and humans and, uh, you know, the... Well, I agree. Even the notion of uploading your consciousness somewhere. I mean, I think that that's where, you know, playing God becomes a very dangerous thing. Right, right. So next up, we did Writers of the Lost Ark. Uh, we kind of touched on that a minute ago, but I thought it was neat that, you know, in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Spielberg has the notion of high places. And this goes back to biblical theology, where in uh, the Old Testament period, any time that Israel would fall into apostasy, they would erect high places on, you know, basically worship groves on top of hills or mountains or whatever to the gods. Uh, and if we think back to the Tower of Babel, that was kind of the same principle, the same idea. So at the top of these high places, you know, would, they would be used for ritual magic with the intention of contacting the so-called gods. And so in biblical theology, the reverse happens with God at Mount Sinai. Mount God meets his people, Moses, uh, at Mount Sinai in kind of a uh, analogous uh, pattern. <clears throat> but that's what goes on with uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant in that film. And as you pointed out, that you know, their eyes kind of, everybody remembers the scene of the dude's eyes melting, the Nazi yeah. guy. <laughs> but that the map room scene is full of all of these Egyptology references. You can see uh, Osiris, Cerberus. There's a version of Cerberus there, the dog star, Sirius. Uh, so in other words, once again, we see the, uh, the notion that Spielberg had a much deeper esoteric concept of what was going on there. For sure. I mean, I, I, I guarantee that it was all very intentional. Right. <laughs> you know, he knew exactly what he was doing. You know, uh, Acts, the book of Acts 7.22, it says that Moses, when he was in Egypt, uh, as a prince of Egypt, that he learned all the uh, mysteries of the Egyptians. Oh, wow. Yeah. So a lot of what uh, probably, there was probably some converse between, you know, the, the Jews and the Egyptians that influenced both theologies. And, you know, language is where it gets tricky because things get twisted based off of the language of who who takes it and runs with it, you know. Now, you did Wizard of Oz, and you did really good on this one. Um, you took it directly in the, the down the course I would have taken with Theosophy. Tell us about this. Well, the Wizard of Oz for me, you know, that was another childhood favorite. Um, you know, and again, it's like everything is very synchronistic of, of all the films that we've, we've analyzed, just in this one, how I think, you know, dealing with, kind of puberty and sexuality growing up, that kind of thing. But um, on a deeper level, I think that Wizard of Oz is kind of the journey of the fool, like of the major arcana. So you take somebody who only has their questions and they kind of experience their lot of characters on the way to understanding the way of the world. And the irony of it is, you know, just like the fool... Dorothy had the power within her all along, but it took all the different twists and turns and characters she met along the way for her to fully realize that it was within her and that the man behind the curtain was just simply that, the man behind the curtain. But, you know, what's interesting and quite brilliant in the film was the use of color and the colors responding to the different chakra systems. And I mean, you could, that film, <laughs> there's so much you could analyze just from the character right. choices, all of it. But, um, Essentially, I mean, it wound up being very Masonic mm -hmm. in the uh, philosophy of it is what I, I came to find. Yeah, right. And it, and it definitely is a direct connect to theosophy. For sure. Well, tell us a little bit about theosophy because how that might connect because we may have readers that uh, or listeners that aren't necessarily familiar with that version of esotericism and Rudolf Steiner and all that? So theosophy, um, theosophy was founded by H.P. Blavatsky, right? I always get the theosophy and anthroposophy right. confused because they're too split. But it's basically the movement that was responsible for New Age. So H.P. Blavatsky traveled the world. You know, at the time it was so controversial because she was one of the, I mean, she was the first woman to, to go to Tibet and, and study with monks. And, you know, she used to hold seances and she found a synthesis between the mystic traditions and 
the traditions of her time. And a lot of it was based off of knowledge of self. So understanding yourself to understand the ways of the world, to understand the ways of the world, to understand the ways of the universe. So it was just different levels of information unfolding on, within one another. So Rudolf Steiner, I mean, he split from it and created right. anthroposophy, which is, is more rooted in the, the concept of like the never new story, where it's also gnosis, but a lot of emphasis is placed on the power of the imagination and mm -hmm. multidimensional beings and, and that, you know, even in <clears throat> with Rudolf Steiner's education system, Waldorf, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he encourages all children playing with wooden toys and no television and just a lot of just harnessing the power of creativity. But, um, you know, H.P. Blavatsky, I think, took it more of an occult-centered way mm -hmm. where it's, you know, using the knowledge of self to kind of manifest what you wish and being aware of, of those powers that are latent within you. So that's kind of like my Cliff's notes of it. No, so, <laughs> right, right. So was... Baum, uh, L. Frank Baum, directly. He was a member of the, the Theosophical Society. Okay, that's yeah. I, I remember reading that, but I was just wondering if there were other, any other connections that that, that he had. Um, like, was he involved in Masonry or something like that? Do you know? Um, I, I know that he was a noted member of the Theosophical Society, um, but I'm not positive. In the article, I had I had went into that, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if he was connected to Freemasonry as well. Yeah. The up. But, uh, he wrote a play called "The Uplift of Lucifer," which is interesting because uh, I think the, you know, from from that perspective, Lucifer is viewed as uh, the Enlightener. You know, not not as a uh, an evil demonic force. So I think that there's a good chance that the connection that people make between, you know, MK Ultra and mind control and all that and the Wizard of Oz stuff, I, I, do you think there's something to that? I tend to think so. I think so too. Um, I, I definitely think because, I mean, like, again, back to the never-ending story, whoever has control has the power. And when people are controlling how powerful you think you are mm -hmm. based off of programming and, you know, hoarding knowledge and coveting that it is it is very similar yeah and uh, Blavatsky's magazine uh, that she started with called the new age um, you know had direct connections to uh, Masonic groups that supported her and so this they would that would go into the UN forming uh, the Lucifer publishing society yeah, I was just going to mention that because all of her work is under the, the Lucifer Trust. Exactly, right. Which, you know, uh, it seems to be quite interesting. <laughs> so let's talk about Gremlins. I had, had It had been on my mind to do Gremlins for a while, but I didn't get around to it. So I was glad to see you do it. And you did exactly what I thought as well, that it has to do with American consumerism. Exactly. Um, you know, it hadn't dawned on me until the last time I watched it, which was around Christmas time. And, you know, like we said before, I really, Spielberg is brilliant. And this was just the perfect way of just that mass consumerism and the dangers of <laughs> not knowing the products that you're buying and yeah. letting it get out of control. Which is funny because, I mean, most people that watch it just took away, oh, Gizmo's so cute. And, man, don't get them wet because <laughs> chaos is going to ensue. But when you see the underlying themes throughout the movie, and then you even see, like, with Gremlins 2, where he mm -hmm. wound up taking it to basically, like, the Megaplex Mall and chaos. <laughs> Great point, yeah. And, and Gremlins 2 even has these subtle references to 9-11 because, the, you know, they blow up wow. the building and there's 9 and 1-1 come up very often in Gremlins 2. Uh, wow. Yeah, I so, yeah, there's a neat video that dissects that. I'll send it to you later. But it's also funny that in Gremlins, the dad goes to Chinatown, to China, uh, to get this, to get Mogwai. And it's funny that all of our, when we're reading it in this economic sense, you know, all of our industry has been outsourced to China. <laughs> <laughs> So when Mogwai comes back and there's all this chaos that ensues, it's almost like, you know, we're, all of our industry has been sent to China and we, we buy all this junk, right? All this uh, garbage that 
we have to consume. And here we are in the midst of chaos. And so I think it's funny that Spielberg presented it like, like kind of like a demonic, just, uh, you know, orgy of, of destruction, which is what, you know, what starts out, what, what starts as a cute little, you know, cute little creature turns into these, these monstrous uh, gremlins. Exactly. And I mean, and Mogwai, for those who haven't read the article, is actually Cantonese for monster. And the ironic thing is that, you know, you're not supposed to feed it after midnight. But what is this monster that we keep feeding is mass consumerism? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Great point. Yeah, the, the belly is never filled. It's just a, a black hole of consumption. Exactly. So next you, you did Pinocchio, which, you did, which was good. Um, so Lorenzini was a Mason, and that obviously influences his uh, presentation of Pinocchio. So tell us about this. Yeah, so um, the author of Pinocchio, like you had said, Lorenzini, was a very active Freemason. Right? Freemason. And uh, Pinocchio was just like encoded with a lot of esoteric concepts that, you know, basically take the journey of, of this wooden child to becoming an illuminated man through kind of foregoing temptation, but experiencing it and seeing where the twists and turns lead him. So, you know, we, we all know the story of Pinocchio, <laughs> where, you know, at first he goes off into the world and um, meets temptation of fortune and fame, so he doesn't go to school and to take the easy route. And all of the easy choices that he makes wind up kind of taking him down the wrong path and leading him astray. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a Masonic concept with, um, who was the one that said it? Manly P. Hall, mm -hmm. that experiences are the chemicals of life with which the philosopher experiments. So it had to be through Pinocchio's experience to understand what it really means to, to be moral and just, you know, morals and dogma, will you? But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other kind of themes throughout it, too, where it's kind of like you could take that alchemical concept where his base is he starts off the wooden boy and then through becomes gold and enlightened through everything he goes through. Um, the other part of it, which was kind of interesting, is the scene where, you know, when Pinocchio heads to Pleasure Island and all the guys there are just goofing off, having a great time, forgetting their families, forgetting school, and then they turn into donkeys. Yeah. There's a deeper esoteric meaning of, of that as well, where, um, let me just pull up my notes, that uh, I guess the donkey in esoteric terms is the personification of a stu stubborn animal locked in the material world and ignoring his true spiritual nature. So, so they're slaves, yeah, slaves to the pack, to baser passions, yeah. Exactly. So ironically, this happens in Pleasure Island. And the other, uh, the other kind of bigger theme within it too which you know as a kid it just seemed to not make any sense like how did Geppetto wind up in the whale you know? right <laughs> right what is going on but what it is is it's kind of indicative of the story of Jonah and the whale where you know Pinocchio has to I guess martyr himself and dive into the belly of the beast mm -hmm. to save who he loves so it's kind of like that concept of, of martyrdom for, for love in order to kind of achieve that enlightenment, if that makes sense. So once again, the, this death of the ego, death of self to, uh, to progress, you know, for transformation, you, there has to be a letting go of, of the attachment to illusions about the self, ultimately. Exactly. And like you had said it once in our other interview where it's like you have to coagulate before you come, become the solvent. Right. You know, it makes me think, too, of AI. Have you seen AI? Spil yes. Okay, yes, yeah. I love your analysis of it. Yeah, and, I mean, obviously it's heavily influenced by Pinocchio, but he took it to also re relate it to basically transhumanism and the future of, of mankind. Uh, I don't ultimately like <laughs> Spielberg's presentation because the only things that survive are the bots. You know, humanity is completely gone. Uh, and it's not even transhumanism in the sense of, you know, uploading your consciousness. It's only the bots that survive. So I think that's a, a dark turn on this. But but it's full, just as full, you know, as Pinocchio with everything from, you know, uh, David's mom using 
trigger words, you know, to, to awaken his consciousness. So we have this, like I was saying earlier about Spielberg and Kabbalism, the idea that certain uh, verbal enunciations, which is a similar concept in, say, magic, verbal enunciations can actually create life. And that's what his mom, in a Gnostic sense, or the Sophia, brings, gives birth to the new, the new life, the new man, the new aeon, uh, through this Kabbalistic enunciation of certain uh, vowels, verbs, and so forth. Do you, you follow me? You get what you see? What I'm getting at? Yeah. And so the words, she, the words she chose seem rather. They are very weird. Yeah. yeah. Cirrus, Socrates, particle, decibel, hurricane, dolphin, tulip, Monica, David, Monica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we have a, a reference to everything from nature to philosophy, uh, you know, to this dialogue, this exchange, Monica, David, Monica. So it's self, other self, which is very much the you know ancient platonic idea of when you have the monad and the monad considers the possibility of the other which hasn't come into being yet and that consideration produces the other and so the interchange between the monad and then the dyad produces this third relation which is the triad and so from that original uh, triad or, or trinitarian conception comes the multiplication of all other principles, all other reality comes out of that. So that's the ancient Platonic idea, and that's what would inform Kabbalism, and that's what uh, Spielberg is working with here. So that's why we have, you know, in Genesis 1, the presentation of creation is done through God speaking verbally, right? And this is where we get cymatics, so you, you know about that. So it, that principle is very true. You know, everything is is actually existing in a kind of frequency or vibration. So even though that may sound new agey, there might be people with a more skeptical perspective on that. That's actually what's going on. That's why you can, you know, play certain notes or tunes, you know, through some sort of instrument that demonstrates geometric patterns on a drum or something with, you know, with sand on it. That's what cymatics is. the science of geometry produced through sound. Exactly. And, and even like thinking back to what, you know, certain opera notes can break the glass. Exactly. Yeah. Great point. <laughs> it's either you can create or destroy with it. Yeah. And Tesla did, did work with that. So the, all the weird stuff that Tesla is doing based on this alternative version of metaphysics, it ties into sound, which is just frequencies. Exactly. You know, and going back to, cause I had this thought when we were discussing before, which was ironic about AI is that, you know, when the son, I forget the son's name from the movie, what, what Monica uh, and David. David, David or the one that's in the, uh, that's in the, the coma. The one that's in the coma. Martin. Martin. So, you know, you see in the beginning, Martin is, is being able to survive through the aid of technology. As right. in the coma. But he awakens, and he's just like a little uh, asshole. Right. Yeah, he's, <laughs> a, he's, he's just a, like a terrible human being. Right. And then you have the irony of David being this piece of technology that actually has more humanity than the human. Yeah, that is iron ironic because <clears throat> they're both in sort of an, an Edenic state at the beginning. And so it's kind of like a Cain Abel situation where exactly. you know humanity becomes Cain and the the bots are the the new new creation. So they're perfected. And and alchemy ultimately is, I think, about this this notion of the perfecting of the imperfect. So nature is imperfect. We see death, corrosion, entropy, destruction. And the goal of the alchemist is to per perfect this or to, to complete the great work of, you know, transcending this defect. And that's ultimately what's going on in AI, as I guess with Pinocchio as well. Yeah. But I mean, the lesson to take away from all of it, and even what we were talking about before with the transhumanism movement, is that you know we can keep building these things outside of ourselves to to further ourselves. But you know, we we rather look without without instead of looking within, where ascension may ultimately actually come from the ascension of our souls, as opposed to this technology that we build outside. Exactly. Of yeah. That's why the ancient Greek maxim is noti siton, which is uh, know thyself. And all the uh, Greek philosophers and uh, Greek church fathers all use this maxim as 
kind of a starting point for, uh, you know, philosophical theology, spirituality, whatever, is that we, if we don't have an accurate conception of ourselves in relationship to the world, then we're not going to properly interpret the world, and we're on kind of one of those wrong turns in the labyrinth, if you will. Exactly. All so, tied together. <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> I wanted to ask you one more thing about Pinocchio. You say, when you were talking about the him being on Pleasure Island, it's been a while since I've watched Pinocchio, but I remember there being a really bizarre scene when, you know, when they start turning into donkeys. Aren't the kids, aren't they like corralled into cages and taken off to be kind of like child slaves? And there's something like that going on. Yeah, exactly. There's a scene where, you know, you see, you see them all being put into cages and it's actually really upsetting. It is. Yeah, I remember as a kid watching that being like, Ugh. Yeah, because you see the one donkey just crying, saying, I want my mom, I want my mom. And, you know, it's too late now, you're off. So, I mean... And what wanna... what happens to them? I can't remember. Where, are they going to be slaves or something? like? Uh... Um, I think that they're just shipping them off to work, to be like work workhorses or something. Child slaves. Um, yeah, so all, they want to play and, and go to Pleasure Island, but at the end of the day, their their fate winds up being way worse. Well, speaking of Disney and weird stuff, did you ever happen to see uh, Escape from Tomorrow? I have not. It's really, really weird. That. Yeah, it's a, kind of an indie film that came out a couple years ago, and it got a lot of attention because supposedly, I don't actually believe this, but supposedly they shot the whole thing secretly inside Disneyland. Huh. Yeah, and it's completely conspiratorial. It's it's really really dark. It's kind of it's a dark satire, but it's also it's kind of like David Lynch type dark. Like it's also revealing, you know, quite a bit. Uh, and you have this just weird uh, presentation of a fairy tale in the form of well, a lot of references to you know, kind of like child trafficking, uh, mind control, uh, all this really bizarre stuff in a supposed satirical expose of Disney as a, as a, I, I tend to think. And so in my analysis of the film, I, I argued that Disney is just kind of a huge mind control complex because when you look at the corporations that funded um, the Epcot center and that, that do all the advanced technology for the theatrics and special effects of Disney, you find out that they're all connected to these huge global entities that, you know, directly, have ties to the CIA and mind control and, and the Defense Department. Wow. Well, I mean, Disney himself was a high-level Freemason. Isn't exactly. Isn't that 33 Club? In, exactly. In yeah. You bet. And then there was the other thing. Well, I, and, all, and all these kids, all these, all these entertainers that come out of Disney that end up as pop stars and, and be, you know, acting so weird. Yeah, I mean, like, when you look at the Britney Spears and, well, Amanda Bynes wasn't Disney, but... Um, you know, they, they seem to take a very similar trajectory of just completely losing it. Right. And, I mean, you have to wonder. I mean, I, I know just people that I've spoken to that were child actors and not even on that level, the levels of abuse and yeah, right. sexual abuse, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah, and so you should check out Escape from Tomorrow. You would, you would really find it fascinating especially given the fact that, you know, it's all the same kind of analysis that we've been doing here. Yeah. And it's almost kind of a revelation of the method. It's almost like, I, I, I suspect Disney probably had some role in that. I can't imagine shooting a film, even an independent film, for hours inside of Disneyland without Disneyland knowing. I mean, Disney, they have surveillance cameras everywhere. <laughs> how are you, you going to do that? <laughs> Well, with everything that we we've studied too, how much disinformation and misinformation, and they fund, and it's just this whole. It's like the those Russian nesting dolls. <laughs> it's like as crazier as it is, there's another level of craziness to it all. Which brings me to Dune, because the, yeah. the aliens in Dune, actually the the ones that are kind of running the cartel, make the explicit statement: "I see plans within plans." What did you What did you make of Dune? Well, when I when I saw Dune, um, I hadn't seen it until I think 2013 is when I watched it for the first time, mm -hmm. and it was actually shortly after I tried DMT for the first time. <laughs> so when I watched it, I'm like, oh my god, this whole movie is about like DMT and the spice and like mm -hmm. the the idea of that we can 
travel within our ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just took away a very psychedelic take on it all. Yeah, in the novel, which this doesn't come out in the the even the director's cut of David Lynch's version, <clears throat> they actually there's a long section of the novel that's put towards explaining the, the ritual that he goes through when uh, Paul is fully initiated into uh, the tribe of the freemen. And it's, he actually crosses the abyss. It's a, it's a crossing of the abyss uh, ritual that he goes through and he can, he's not completely divine. He's kind of a semi semi God status where he has certain powers, but he doesn't have, you know, omniscience or omnipresence. He's just able to do certain things through his consciousness being awakened by the hallucinogenic effects that the spice has. But what's so fascinating is that this is a science fiction novel that presents so many real world geopolitical facts. Like the, 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 I think there's a clear connection to Sufism. And if you read about Frank Herbert, which I've read a good bit about him, he was involved in traditional traditionalism, perennialism, the school of Rene Ganon and people like that. And that's a very, uh, it's very much connected to the kind of things that we've been talking about. It's not necessarily Masonic. Uh, Rene Ganon spent a time in masonry and then he got into Sufism. So for Herbert to incorporate all of this into uh, the novel, I mean, he, he's writing this back in, I think, the 60s, and he's talking about weather warfare, uh, you know, terraforming planets. You know, it's just amazingly, an amazing degree of foresight, you know, for that time period. Completely. I mean, that's, that's what's the, the wild part about watching movies. I mean, that book you said is from the 60s, but then the movie's from the 80s. Right. And then watching and revisiting and now and seeing how it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. <laughs> yeah, they have an imperial ecologist who his whole job is to... Uh, terraform planets through uh, weather control. So <laughs> they've they've completely mastered you know weather manipulation, which is exactly what we see with harp and things like that. That you know, it's amazing to me that people still don't think that there's such a thing as weather manipulation, weather control. When yeah. and I have to be honest, I mean I I live in New Jersey as you know, and when I experienced Hurricane Sandy. It just didn't feel right intuitively. Mm -hmm. And like at my, my personal point of view is that was definitely some kind of weather modification. Mm -hmm. That could be maybe me taking it to another level, but it just didn't feel right. So we'll close out, I think, with a little, a few more topics related to legend, because that's what uh, we're going to be working on. This next analysis will be legend. And I think that even though we talked about, you know, the, the, the sexual aspects of it, it's funny that the, the, tr the transgression, as I rewatched it, comes at the point when Lily, again, this emblematic of, you know, the, the white virgin or whatever, Lily touches the horn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's the point of transgression. She's not supposed to touch it. Then we have this fall into winter that, you know, they make the explicit statement that winter is coming. And of course... Uh, classic literary tradition. Winter is associated with it's the time of death. It's when death comes. Mm -hmm. And what? But I want to know what you make of the dance macabre that that bizarre scene where Lily has her alter black persona and she's being seduced by this uh, this demon. It's not actually Satan because he actually the character says that he ser he serves you know a higher form of evil. What do you make of that whole scene? Well, you know, if, if we talk even going back to the Wizard of Oz and the idea of colors and the way that the, right. um, things are depicted based off of color. So you have this red demon and red is what your root chakra and that is the base for like sexual desire. Mm -hmm. And as she's dancing with her demon, I think it's dancing with the whole sexual temptation. Exactly. I mean, the whole movie, I think, is like based off of like sexual temptation and you know, innocence being tainted by, by, you know, temptation. But the scene with the dance is it's just kind of dancing with, with that demon. <laughs> yeah, but it's almost like there's a, so there's two versions of her. So her, there's like a split of her psyche between Lily the Virgin. And then there's this completely black, you know, she's wearing black, she looks like a goth chick, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Exactly. Which is which is the you know the Carl, the Jungian version of the the shade or right? the alter self. So you have the normal you, and then you have this alter dark side you. Exactly. I mean, and that could be even like the you know we see how in the beginning she falls to temptation by just touching the horn, but then you know as she becomes her alter and she's dancing with it and in like the sexual way, it's just fully I think diving into that. But the whole storyline which i think most people miss is that it revolves around the ring so there's this wedding ceremony that needs to happen right so i think it's a question of is she going to be caught up in you know in the beginning she's innocent and and foolish and naive and she has her sexual experience in a mystical allegorical way and that ring is lost and it falls to the bottom of the water and it's you know the water freezes over and you know jack's kind of stuck uh, well, this is towards the end, right? And so when he gets the ring, he finally breaks out. And I think we're supposed to presume that there's some sort of a union between uh, Jack representing, you know, nature. He's kind of a, uh, he's a pan sort of figure, kind of, a, you know, the spirit of the woods, force of nature. He's surrounded by all these birds and whatnot. And then Lily's tempted by the dark side, where if you notice when they go to, the layer, the demonic spirit there is, uh, he's using technology, right? So he's forging armor, forging swords down there in his, his layer or whatever. And he's going to sacrifice the uh, unicorn for the purpose of technological, I guess, uh, imperial control. Uh, and so Lily has to go back to, <clears throat> Uh, her union with with uh, with Jack from you know the natural man, if you will. So this is this is a common theme too throughout a lot of fiction, especially like the Lord of the Rings. That's the whole purpose of the Lord of the Rings is that the you know the tower that I at the top of the tower is the result of a lot of technology, right? So throughout the film, uh, Sal, uh, Sauron working for Sauron is explicitly stated as. Um, you know, creating te technological advances. You know, he creates gunpowder. He creates, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the weapons of war, the machinery of war, and the, you know, the ants, the tree, tree folk uh, are upset about being burned down to build all these, you know, build all these technological weapons of war. So it ends with you know the destruction of the ring of power, right? So it's the same idea with uh, with legend, except that the ring, the ring here seems to represent the imbalance that either side of this of this principle, whether it's Jack in nature or, you know, Lily and her feminine flirtations with, uh, you know, different, different sides of her persona, you know, there's a lack that both sides need, uh, have in one another. Definitely. And another interesting note, too, you know, going back to the scene. So when Lily first finds the unicorn, it's a very sexual the way that the unicorns are running down this stream mm -hmm. and the way that it's shot you know you see the stream of water coming and nature on both sides and the unicorns running through and that's where she first touches for temptation mm -hmm. and then she throws her ring into the water so deeper into the waters of life and you know oh, okay. water right from an esoteric standpoint has a lot of symbolism to it as well kind of like the waters of life <laughs> but um you know what's interesting too with the idea of like an orgasm, something so seemingly so small, having mm -hmm. so much power. I mean, I, are you familiar with the work of Willem Reich? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, using the orgasm technology and whatever else. I mean, I right. wonder, there's so much mystical stuff behind the power of the orgasm as, as a technology in itself. I wonder on a deeper, deeper mystic level. Sure, like yeah. That. And even in, in the mind control experiments, they were using technology to, you know, uh, manipulate certain parts of the brain connected with the orgasm reflex so they could actually, you know, cause <laughs> just constant oh. orgasms, right? Oh, right. I've been told I can cause that in girls too, but it's not really a thing. Ah, I've got to throw in a sex joke, but, yeah. um, so yeah, but, but, but what do you make of the, the scene though at the end, the climax when they're, they're going to sacrifice the, unicorn the, that the demon is going to sacrifice the unicorn for the purpose of, you know, releasing that power. And he says, I'm a part of every one of you. He says, you can't get rid of me. I'm part of every, I'm, 
I'm an aspect of every one of you. And then at the conclusion, if you watch the, in the version I have, the director's cut, there's a, this song that they sing. It's a really, really cheesy, goofy song, but it's all about Gnosticism. Like it's, it's explicitly about how light and dark are just flip sides of the same coin. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you, I think you hit it on the head where, you know, we, in my, in my point of view, you know, if, if everything is connected, you're connected to the good just as much as you're connected to the bad, you know, it's, the light is there, but the shadow will always be there, you know, like, like we talked about earlier in the interview too, like you could be madly in love, but you're still always going to have to battle temptation, which has nothing to do with love. It's just battling that like lust within you. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, him saying I'm a part of every one of you, it's just, it's kind of like that whole notion too, back to the labyrinth as well of like knowing that if you can master your mind and understand that these are aspects of yourself that you can control through your thoughts and through your restraint, it's not something to fear. It's something to just be able to understand it'll just go right back into the universe because it's all part of what's connected. Do you know that medieval cathedrals would actually encode in the architecture of the floor? A lot of them actually have huge labyrinths on the floor. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, and, and they <laughs> used it as an allegory. It was a common allegory in the Middle Ages for, for life itself. So, I mean, a lot of people might think that this is antithetical to Christianity and some of these esoteric ideas, but it's pretty common, actually, in the Middle Ages that people, you know, because you had a lot of, the population couldn't read, so they were used to, you know, the looking at symbolism in terms of the architecture, right? So you would have the gargoyles at the top of the cathedral on the outside of the church, you know, that's supposed to symbolize the world and how the world's run by demons, and then the church is, you know, God's sanctuary, etc., in the same way, you would have in the floor different uh, patterns of labyrinths, and that was supposed to, you know, symbolize your journey through this life and not being lost and, you know, lost down the wrong path. So there we go. There's a lot of sacred geometry in churches too. Exactly. That's what I, that's what it is. is exactly. And, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so that covers all that. What do you think? Did you saw? Uh, Mad Max Fury Road. What did you think of that? I thought it was brilliant. You know, for since we've be fr been friends, I, I know you've been telling me to watch Mad Max, and you know, that's one I, I've always kept on the back burner. So I've never seen the original version, and uh, you know, I, I was really excited about seeing this just because from a visual aspect. And you know, what's ironic is, is this movie that's in a car, and it's mostly a car chase that has absolutely nothing to do with cars. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, this post, post-apocalyptic future where it's a kind of like reminiscent of Tank Girl in a lot of ways. It is, too. Yeah. Yeah. The world is very arid and, you know, they're controlling the water and controlling population. Right. But um, I, thought, I thought it was brilliant. I mean, I, I even said afterwards that the first thing I wanted to do was read your analysis because I, I had so many different ways that I could process it. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would love to hear you articulate the, what like it represents in its entirety. <laughs> well, as I argued in my piece, I think you have to look at Beyond Thunderdome because it's the immediate predecessor. So you, you have three films prior to Fury Road. The first one, Mad, just called Mad Max, is George Miller's kind of film school project. So it's you can appreciate it for what it is. It's not as great a spectacle as uh, you know Fury Road by any means, but for the low budget that he had, he was able to produce a, a pretty amazing film. And it has some really exciting chase scenes, you know, for being a, a B movie. The sequel road warrior is another still kind of B movie, but he had, he had a bigger budget for it, but it's mainly just about resource wars. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of philosophy or esoteric symbology in road warrior. Uh, it's just kind of what it is. It's just, bare bones, you know, everybody in a social Darwinian sense trying to survive, you know, after this apocalypse. And the, the one resource everyone needs is, is fuel. Uh, so fuel becomes the new economy, the new form of money. And then with Mad Max, beyond Thunderdome, things take a turn towards really, really profound esoteric ideas. So you have all, you have this introduction of this uh, this whole new order of society based around uh, bartering 
everyone's been radiated. Uh, and there's all this strangeness around Max meeting up with this group of kids that live outside the, the new civilized order. Um, and they're kind of a lost boys, you know, Peter Pan scenario. It borrows a lot from that imagery, but they've, they've seen in their, their construction of mythology, right? So that they were part of a plane crash when the apocalypse happened and they were all really, really young. And all they had left was uh, like a view master, you know, that little eighties toy that you have where you click the, the button and you see a different, uh, Image, do you know what a Viewmaster is? Yeah, they yeah. used to have one. Okay. <laughs> well, so all they have is like a Viewmaster, uh, a few artifacts from the plane, and what they do as kids is construct an entire mythology about where they come from. So they knew that at one time there was things called tellies, uh, the tell, and they knew that there were things called uh, skyscrapers, and they knew that they, they flew on a plane, and that there was a guy named Captain Walker who flew the plane, but he died. Uh, and so he died leaving to find help. But he never came back, so they developed this elaborate mythology based around just the artifacts that were left over from their crash. And so they had kind this... Of a cargo cult idea. Yeah, so they had this idea of the return of Captain Walker, that he's their redeemer and savior, And then he'll come back one day and lead them to, you know, founding a new civilization. So it has all this strange uh, Kabbalistic, you know, symbolism in that I never could make sense of when I, it was one of my favorite movies growing up. Uh, And, you know, it's only been in the last few years that I think I really figured it out because what it is is just that Max is a new avatar. He's a new presentation of um, who he would be deified. He would become... Uh, the legend of, of Max would, from or Captain Walker uh, would be the tradition that would be the new civilization. And so that's how the, I hate to spoil it for you, but that's how the film ends is that they're all sitting around uh, in a new civilization telling the story of the legend of Max, who inadvertently was captain. So he accidentally fulfills the, the, the children's you know, prophetic prediction. <laughs> of a redeemer, like so it wasn't his plan. He just stumbled into this, but he, yeah. you know, in a deeper sense, fulfills it. And so I just thought it was crazy that there was all this symbology of the yantra, which is the Hindu, uh, you know, imagery that you focus on for meditation, and it's connected with the idea of invoking the gods. Uh, and this is what the kids are doing <laughs> inadvertently. They're kind of like Sarah in the labyrinth is inadvertently invoking, uh, you know, this process. This is what the children are doing. Uh, when Max becomes their sort of their new their new savior, so they they inadvertently invoked him. <laughs> exactly, and so what I saw was that Fury Road kind of takes a darker turn from that. Whereas, so Mad Max gives you this this inkling of hope. Thunderdome gives you this inkling of hope that you know civilization can be rebuilt. Uh, mankind is not doomed. It still has the the secrets of knowledge. Is is a, a big part of that film because the little midget guy that they rescue, he, he, they call him the, he has the knowing it's called, right? So he has knowledge of technology. He's able to rebuild the civilization, but Fury Road takes a darker turn where it's no longer civilization. It's more of a, uh, a tribal, uh, just, you know, completely, uh, completely based around power politics. It's just tribalism and, brute forces of nature. <clears throat> so I saw Fury Road as basically an allegory of, of chaos magic. So rather than it being the idea that we can tap into all these deeper concepts of Kabbalah and build some great civilization or whatever, uh, the furtherance of technology, technology in Fury Road is completely at the service of power politics. It has no deeper significance. The only thing that matters is uh, protecting one's seed. Survival is completely, completely a survivalist um, presentation, and the whole, just the whole experience of it, I think, is just supposed to be an overwhelming, you know, overwhelm the senses through, you know, um, basically sensory overload. I guess is what I would say. So, <laughs> so I, I said it, it's it's alchemy concerned with the union of opposites into a synthesis 
where male and female are uh, it's not it's not an, an alchemy of union it's an alchemy of uh, opposition right so what you have is the removal of that patriarchal order with that nasty character that that's got all the harem of, of supermodels and you have the rise of basically the the feminine so the feminine's going to r- rule uh in rather than it being a union it's 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 a complete inversion so just a new power structure a new a new just the, that cyclical approach that out of chaos comes a new reign of order then we got to have more chaos and then another reign of order and then more chaos do you see what i'm saying Completely. And, and, you know, what we talked about, too, is like you had said, some people it took away from it kind of like that feminist, like girl power thing. But mm-hmm. I think really what it meant was the idea of more like the female mind. You know, here exactly. we are with like the male, the male order and things being like very like logic, reason, data, like just putting it in the condition that it was in. And I don't think it represents like females needing to be in control. I think it's more like that activating that side of the mind. Could be, yeah, it could be. Uh, I mean, I don't think that it was as feminist as a lot of people were drumming up. They were making up this big hype about it, which probably worked in reverse to send more people to go watch the movie than, than yeah. any kind of you know, boycotts tend, you know, sometimes do that, with, especially with films that just hypes up, hypes things up, and I people didn't go see it. Take away some like feminist agenda. That wasn't like what I thought the message was from it. Well, I think there was some of that there, though, because in feminist theology and ideology, the idea is that God is, you know, because he's a patriarch, that's the uh, that's the origin of warfare. So if we didn't have men around, the war boys in the film, if if, if we yeah. if we had uh, women in control, we would have uh, there wouldn't be war anymore. And I've had arguments with feminists about this very point, and they'll make that argument. Well, men are the reason that we have all this warfare. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, as a woman, I want you to be honest with me. Do you honestly think that the? I'm sure you've met, you know, corporate gals, women, you know, in in positions of power. Uh, do you, are they not pretty pretty? I'm uh, probably gonna get a lot of flack <laughs> for saying this, but I'm just gonna keep it real. Um, I really think you're more apt to have people tearing each other's faces off if you have a room full of women competing with each other. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. To be honest, you know, I. I, I so it's not that it's not that women uh, would bring peace uh, and men only bring war. I mean, men and women are. are I mean, they they do this to one another all the time. Yeah, I I, I can't stand the ism. So, yeah. you know, when people, when I tell people that I'm not a feminist immediately, they're like, oh, how could you not be? The thing is, is that I'm a humanist. And I think that we, we're all connected to one another. We have a left side of the brain. We have a right side of the brain. We all have this dual nature, shadow self, light self, angel, demon, you know, male, female. It's all part of, of the one. In order to find balance, you have to understand that you're going to be both of those things always. You know, but to be like, it has to be strictly female, it's, it's strictly patriarchal, I think that's where it becomes dangerous. And, you know, like I said, what I've noticed is that, especially with females, there, there isn't as much cooperation. It is very competitive, and I think mm-hmm. a lot of that is probably due to, like, programming, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and having to kind of compete to, to get the husband or to get where you need to get, but... Um, I think it's really dangerous to say that men are only the cause of war. <laughs> well, yeah, and if civilization collapses into a scenario where we're back to Mad Max style tribes, I'm going to bet that women are going to be happy to have men around that can protect them f- from roving gangs of those. <laughs> yeah. I mean, men, men have gone forth to war to protect civilization, right? So it's not as if you can just use some you know, mindless uh, ideological statement that men are the cause of war. I mean, how many, we wouldn't have the furtherance of the human race without, you know, humans protecting the tribe. I mean, even if we were to go back to some primal, you know, tribal situation, men had to protect the tribe from, you know, wild animals, right? So, exactly. and it's not that, it's not that women uh, are always weak and, you know, couldn't ever, fulfill that kind of role. Certainly there have been female soldiers at times in history, but the point is rather that that, that has almost always fallen just by nature to the, the role, to the male. 
Uh, so there's exactly. no, there's nothing. And that's just how nat- nature is, you know. In nature, there's always in a pack of animals, there's different roles that we fulfill. I mean, personally, like, I I wouldn't want to go to war. I don't want to be the soldier. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I wouldn't want to do that. I'd rather protect my family and and fulfill the role that I feel comfortable with. That's not to say that women can't do it or shouldn't if that's what they feel called to. But you know, I just I think it tends to get dangerous when it becomes that ism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So that, I think that's a, a pretty good discussion we've had so far. Is there any, any other, uh, things you'd like to plug with what you're working on, where you're going with Evolve and Ascend? What can we expect in the near future? Well, um, with Evolve and Ascend, we're branching off into doing a lot more events. So, uh, coming up on June 20th in New York, we have a summer solstice celebration with, um, Sharon Rose, who's a, an author and she has a movie out called the last avatar. So, It'll be a screening of the film and um, some other fun stuff, but I'll have uh, more details about that on EvolveAndAscend.com. And actually this winter, I spent the winter writing, um, but we're just going to have a lot more media, a lot more experiential events and, you know, a lot of good stuff on the horizon. All right. That's EvolveAndAscend.com. So readers and listeners can go check that out. And we will soon have a pretty in-depth analysis of legend coming forth. So this has been Jay's Analysis. I want to thank Alternate Current Radio for running this podcast. And I want to thank Patrick Henningsen and Hesher for hooking me up with that. And again, jaysanalysis.com and check out evolveandascend.com. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jay.